Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. A reminder, as you are making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link. So you get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com, but part of the purchase price was to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Now, it is time for this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The original air date is March the 31st, 1953, and the title is The Lester James Matter. For your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Ned Talbot, Johnny. What are you working on? Why, nothing at the moment. I was thinking of going to New York for a couple of days. Why? Well, I have one here on my desk you might be able to do something with while you're there. Well, tell me about it. Corinthian covers a textile outfit in New York, Wallace Cottons and Company. This week their auditors found a shortage in the books. How much of a shortage? Well, it's nearly 5000 uh, Wait, I got it right here. Uh, $4,185. And I'm supposed to find out who took it? Oh, no, we already know who did that. One of the bookkeepers in their office, uh, Lester James. He's been arrested and admitted everything. I thought maybe you could find out what he did with all that money. Well, I'm going to New York anyway. I'll see what I can do. Expense accounts submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Continental Adjustment Bureau, 418 Elizabeth Avenue, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Lester James matter. Expense account item one, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. After receiving from Ned Talbot the necessary information concerning the indemnity claim of Wallace Cottons and Company, Incorporated. I arrived in New York at 1.30 in the afternoon and checked in at the New Weston. Central Division told me that Lester James was being held in the 17th Precinct Jail. I went right over. Well, here you are, darling. Now what? Uh, take it easy, James. This is Johnny Dollar. He wants to talk to you. Hello, James. Hi. Uh... I'll see you later, Dollar, huh? Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. You give me a yell when you finish, huh? Right. Well, what are you? Lawyer or something? Nope. I don't want a lawyer. I said somebody would be around to talk to me again, but I don't want to see anybody. Why not? I just don't want to see anybody, that's all. Well, you'll have to be represented by counsel when you go into court. All right, let somebody represent me. Just a technicality, anyhow. I know what'll happen in court. I've got my confession. Who are you, anyway? I'm an insurance investigator. Well, what are you doing here? It's a swell day outside. I'm trying to find out what you did with that 4185 bucks that you took from Wallace Cottons. Oh, that. Yeah, that. How about it, James? Isn't it enough that I'm in jail? It's enough for the police, but not for my insurance company. I don't have anything to say to you. Now, look, don't be foolish. A whole or a partial recovery will have a lot to do with what happens to you in court. I don't want to be foolish. It's just that I spent it all, every dime of it. No way to pay it back. Spend it on what? Doesn't make any difference. Might make a lot of difference. I don't have anything to tell you. You've never been in trouble before, have you? No, no. They think of things like that when a man comes up for sentencing. Now, this is your first offense. I know, I know. You trying to shield somebody, James? Why don't you go away? You been trying the market? Did you gamble with it? No, no, just leave me alone. I won't tell you anything, Mr. Dollar. If you bought something with it or gave it to somebody, if it can be recovered in some way... No, part... no, I tell you, go away, leave me alone. I'd like to, but you're a thief, James. And you're going to get what's coming to you. 
I can't leave you alone. Listen. Now, you listen to me. If I don't get the information I want from you, I'll get it elsewhere. I'm going to be real honest with you. Corinthian Liability wrote a blanket policy on Walls, Cottons, and Company, promising to pay them in full for every loss caused by fire or theft on their premises. Now, no insurance company takes the word of some guy sitting in a jail cell where there's cash to be recovered. It's the same as stolen property. If you gave it to someone or spent it when it wasn't yours, it's still redeemable. Now, what do you have to say? Look, Mr. Dollar, this won't do you any good. I'm no low forehead job who got caught crawling in a drugstore window. I'm a college graduate. I've been in the business world for ten years or better. I know what I want to tell you and what I want to keep to myself. And I don't want to talk about this, do you understand? And there's no way or no person who can make me talk about it. I took the money, I admitted that. I did a bad job of it, I was caught, I've confessed, and you've got me. And that's the whole story. Okay. Have it your way, Lester. Go away. Just go away, please. Lester James was a tall, dark-complexioned man in his early 30s. His hair was black, straight, and closely cropped. His features regular. Not good, not bad. The kind of man you see every day on the street. Somehow, the kind of man I hadn't expected to meet. Expense account item two. Dollar thirty-five. Cab fare. I went over to the apartment on 59th Street where Lester James had lived. According to the penciled note above the first door to the right of the entrance, Mrs. Anastasia Denovich was the manager. Yes, what is, please? Uh, you're uh, Mrs. Denovich? Yes, what do you want, mister? I understand that uh, Mr. Lester James lived here. Is that right? Oh, uh, yes. Bad. Bad. I hear he still money, and that's bad. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the insurance company, Mrs. Denovich. We're trying to recover some of that money if we can. Wonder if you could help me. I fix dinner now for my son. He's come home from work. What I do? Well, I want to know about Lester James. About this. The works, Mrs. Denovich. Did he drink? Gamble? Did he stay in nights or go out? Did he pay his rent? You're a policeman? Insurance investigator. Oh, please. Sometime else. Look, it's important now. I talked to Lester on phone. He said I don't have to answer any question. Well, you don't have to, but I'd appreciate it if you would. My son home soon. Uh, oh. All right, mister. I know these things. You ask about men who live here. Well, look, how about his friends? Who visited them? I no. I cannot say no visitor. Oh, is he a good tenant? No trouble, like Mr. O'Sullivan on third floor, always drunk. Fine. Did you ever meet his girl? Girl? Well, sure, his girl. He oh. has a girlfriend. No, I, I never see girlfriend. Uh, how long have you known him? Five, six years, maybe, ever since he moved in here, this place. You know how he spent his time? Work. He wore a cart. No, I mean besides working at the textile company. How else? I, no. He poor fellow, that one. How's that? He still money through, but he poor fellow, just same. For him, I feel. Yeah. Lester, he quiet and he think. I know he live up in that little room quiet. Think he does all the time, he think. Oh, my son's dinner, please, you go now. Uh, just a minute. I'd like to see his apartment, if I can. Mm. No matter. You bring key back, please. Mm, thank you, Mrs. Denovich. The apartment Lester James had lived in was as dismal as the neighborhood. A tiny closet kitchen, a bed that came out of the wall, and a pair of grimy windows that looked across the court into another pair of equally grimy windows. The furniture was early 30s and threadbare. Among his personal effects, I found nothing of value. The apartment yielded no more information than James had. Expense account item three, $1.95, dinner. I had it in a neighborhood restaurant called the 59er, a place where, I learned, Lester James had frequently eaten. The restaurant manager remembered him and liked him. A woman who ran a bakery shop across the street told me how he'd come back from the war in 1946 and had worn his uniform for a month until he got a job and could buy some civilian clothes. All in all, I was getting a composite picture of Lester James that didn't look quite right. Whatever he was to the people who knew him casually, 
He wasn't a man who ever had any money to spend. Well, hiya. Hi. No good, huh? Uh-uh. Well, that's the way it goes. <clears throat> we had some action here today, no? Oh? Sit down. <laughs> James' preliminary hearing was this afternoon. The man from the district attorney's office took about 15 minutes to lay out the evidence against James. Uh-huh. And the public defender took about three minutes trying to get James to answer one question. What did he do with the money? Did I miss anything? No, not a thing. Wouldn't open up at all. Just said that he'd spent it. Well, public defender about threw up his hands. I'm about ready to throw up mine. When is the trial set for? Uh, sometime next week. I'd like to talk to him again. He been moved yet? Didn't go to the sheriff's office. Somebody bail him? He bailed himself. $200 he had in war bonds. He left yet? No. Uh-uh. Go get out till about six. That's when the ship changes. Are oh, you still want to see him? Yeah, I'll wait. An hour later, when Lester James emerged from the doorway and turned right, I followed him, but a half a block behind. When he caught a cab and headed uptown, I caught one. Stayed right with him. When he got out at the Empress Theater and walked around to the stage door. I was standing at the alley entrance. Ten minutes later, he came out and hailed a cab. Once more, I followed. This time, he went back to his apartment on 59th Street. I waited 15 minutes before I went in. James? James? James, it's me. Johnny Dollar. I got a couple of whiffs of it standing there in front of the door. room was acrid, stinging with gas fumes, and Lester James was stretched out on the floor of his six-foot kitchen. <coughs> when I picked him up and carried him out, I didn't know whether he was alive or dead. star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Thirty seconds after I found Lester James, I'd called a police ambulance. In a matter of minutes, an intern was working over him with a pull motor. There was no telling how much gas he breathed in or for how long a time the jet had been open. Hand me that. Thanks. Swab. Okay. You alive? Maybe. Hard to say on these. That shot should cause some reaction. Oh. This your place? No, it's his. You know him? His name is Lester James. I met him earlier today. Can you give me that? Uh, we might be getting something here. About this thing? Yeah. He'll be sick if... Oh. What? He's catching on. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's have a little more. Getting some pulse. Respiration, too. Will you make it? Well, it depends. If he had a heart condition, it'll be tough. There's nothing more we can do here. Let's move him. Now, where'll he be? 48th Street Emergency. Why? Well, I'd like to talk to him when he comes around. Better phone in first. I'm oh, sure. Well, that's the third one tonight. What is it, the weather? Not for him. You know why? He's out on bail. Goes to trial on an embezzling charge pretty soon. Oh. Well, be sure and call in. Yeah, right. Investigating officers questioned me regarding the circumstances of Lester James's attempted suicide. I told them what had happened and gave them my business address for reference. After that, I went back to my hotel and had dinner. Then I went over to the Empress Theater. A musical show was playing there. And it had just finished. I didn't quite get that, mister. A dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. What can I do for you, sir? Between 6.30 and 7 o'clock tonight... Man came here to the stage entrance and talked to you. Uh, a lot of people talk to me here. What man? 
His name was Lester James. Uh, no, I don't remember no Lester James. Maybe he didn't give you his name. Uh, he come here to see somebody? Is that better? He might have. I don't know. He's about 5'11". Weighs 175 or 80. Didn't have any hat on. Raincoat. Dark man. You remember him? Oh, oh, yes, of course. Him, yes. You remember him? Oh, sure, yeah. He's been around a lot of times. Lester Jim. <laughs> you know, I didn't even recognize that name first. Well, would you mind telling me what he was doing here? Well, he comes here to see Margie Cook. That his girlfriend? Oh, no, I don't think so. She never sees him when he asks. Who's Margie Cook? Uh, she sings here. You ever seen them together? Well, don't know. I've never seen them together. Is she still here? Yeah, uh, what's that? I'd like to talk to her. Is she still here? Oh, no, no, Margie left. She finishes in the second act. Could you tell me where she lives? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I can't tell you that. Well, where can I phone her? Well, I just can't tell you that either. Look, would you do me a favor? Well, if I can, what is it? Would you telephone her and tell her my business and ask her if she'd see me? Well, I suppose I can do that all right, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> Take a chair right there. I'll just see what I can do for you. Expense account item four, $2.65. More cab fare. This time to the apartment of Margie Cook, singer. She met me at the door with cold cream on her face, wrapped in a chenille dressing gown. Uh, Miss Cook? You must be Mr. Dollar. Come in, please. Thank you. I, I didn't quite understand Frank on the telephone. Frank? Oh, the, the doorman at the theater. Yeah. Yes. I didn't quite know what to make of it. Goodness, are you really an insurance detective? Yeah, investigator. Can I fix you a drink? No, no, thanks. You mentioned something about a man named Lester James, Mr. Dollar? Yes. You know him? Well, no, I don't. There's a sort of a reservation in the way you say that, Miss Cook. You know his name? Yes, I know the name. What's this all about? Oh, just a routine investigation. Are you sure? Oh, yes. I'm curious. How did you get my name? How am I connected with Lester James? Well, that's what I want you to tell me. Oh, first, about my name. Well, James was at the theater tonight asking for you. I found that out from the doorman. And then I asked to speak to you. Oh. I understand James has been around there quite a bit. I... I really don't know how to tell you this. I've only seen the man once in my life. Is that so? Honestly. He's... Well, he's really quite impossible. I... Oh, dear... This is very embarrassing to be asked about a thing like this by a complete stranger. Well, maybe I can save you that embarrassment if you'll answer one question. All right. He ever give you any presents? Yes. What? Well, that cigarette case there. This one? Mm-hmm. And the lighter to go with it. Uh-huh. Tiffany's. Pretty, aren't they? And expensive. What else? Well, let me think. Oh, that wasn't from him. Oh, that was. What? The lamp over there. Uh-huh. And a fur piece. Uh, could I see that? I'm afraid I gave it away. Oh, I see. I gave it to my kid sister who was visiting me a couple of months ago. What kind of fur piece was it? Ermine. Ermine. I think that's about it. Except for orchids that used to come every night. A dozen orchids every night. He sent them to you? Mm-hmm. For about three months. You only saw him once, and he gave you all these gifts. Oh, dear, I, I know how that must sound. Look, it started about six months ago, I guess. I got a card in my dressing room one night asking me to dinner. It was signed Lester James. Well, I'd never heard of anyone named Lester James, and I tore it up. But every night after that, I kept getting a card, and pretty soon flowers, and then the lighter and the cigarette case came. That's when I saw him. I didn't even dine with him, Mr. Dollar. We had one drink, and I told him I had a headache. I see. Gifts still kept coming, flowers, invitations, and I ignored them. I tried to send the things back, but I didn't know where to send them, so I gave away some, and some I've kept, and that's it. Why didn't you see him after that one night? Oh, he was... he was so different than what I'd imagined. I mean, I've had my share of stage door johnnies, but this man was... Well, he couldn't say a word without stumbling. He had no poise, no sophistication, nothing. All he had was money. I see well, he didn't have money either, Miss Cook. What? He worked for $72 a week as a bookkeeper. But all the gifts, the things he gave me, sent me, he had to have money. He's been stealing it to buy those things for you. For heaven's sake. Why, for heaven's sake. And that's why you're here. No wonder. 
She tried to commit suicide a couple of hours ago. Suicide? No. Oh, no. I'm sorry I had to come to you to get this information. He wouldn't tell anybody what he'd done with the money. Will he go to prison? I'm afraid so. Oh, but we had nothing. He was just a name to me. Well, apparently, you were something more to him. I spent the next two days tracking down the places from which the gifts had been purchased and ascertaining their retail values. Totaled $2,780. I also learned from Margie Cook that Lester James had made appointments to meet her at various times at different expensive restaurants around town. She had never once kept any of these appointments. A check with the Waldorf, 21, the Stork, and several other places revealed that James had always made elaborate arrangements to entertain her. His restaurant bills, which were paid, came to $835. The florist bill, $680. Total, $4,295. Hello? Hi. Remember me? Sure. Insurance man. What now? How do you feel? Okay. You saved me, didn't you? I suppose so. Why? Well, for the same reason you'd save a man who was dying, James. <laughs> you know what I've been doing? What? Answering the questions that you wouldn't answer. I met Margie Cook. What? It's my job. I had to. Listen, you had no right to go to her. You had no right. Look, it's the company's money you were spending on her. I had every right. Unpleasant as it may be. And she... She knows all about me? Yep. We took back all the things you gave her. You, you dirty scum. Look, look, don't get mad at me. Get mad at yourself. I didn't steal the money. You did. Why didn't you leave it alone? What difference does the money make to you? Nothing to me. What do you want now? Well, I didn't get all of it traced down. There's still $410 I'm worried about. I, uh... Yeah. Here. I've got this much. Yeah. Can you remember what you did with the rest of it? Pretty thorough, aren't you? I try to be. Well? Oh, come on, Lester. We've got most of it. What difference does it make now? You and your money. That's all it is to you. Dollars and cents. Dollars and cents that were stolen. Remember that. What did you do? See her on the stage one night? No. She was in the office. Office? Your office? Yes. Some fashion convention about six months ago. She was modeling some of our fabrics for them. The publicity people brought her over. I never saw anyone like that before. You figured a little money would attract her to you, huh? I heard that's the best way to do it. Well, it's one way, but it's not the best way, Lester. I, I pictured myself knocking on her door one night and saying... I'm a bookkeeper, and I live on 59th Street. Why don't you come over and have a bottle of beer with me? You know, she might have come. What makes you think so? I met her. Up until the time I talked with Lester James in the emergency hospital, I had my doubts about love at first sight. But after I talked to him, I was convinced that it could and did happen to him. I was sorry that he didn't know quite how to handle it. I was also wondering if I'd been in his shoes, would I have done the same thing? Johnny Dollar. Oh, I was afraid you might have left town. Well, I'm just packing up. Who's this? Margie Cook. Remember me? Oh, yeah, sure. I haven't been able to sleep thinking about, well, thinking about that man. Lester James? Yes. What'll happen to him? He'll go to prison. Even with all of the money returned? Only half of that stuff's redeemable. Take at least, oh, 2,500 more. And then what? Well, then it would be up to the court. I want to pay it. What? I want to make it up, the whole thing. Look, Miss Cook, uh, I know your motives are the best, but uh, you're not responsible in any way for this man's actions. He just went... dollar. He's the first man I've ever known who actually went out on a limb for the girl he loved. I'm the girl and he's the man. 
Are you serious? Poor Dumbbell. He doesn't belong in any prison. He ought to get married to some nice girl. I want to help him. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah. What's the matter? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Expense account item five. $28, hotel. Item six, $37, meals. Item seven, $15.15, miscellaneous. Item eight, same as one, transportation back home. Total, $151.22. Remarks, James comes to trial next week in view of Margie Cook's paying back the money he stole. James just might get a suspended sentence, but... As always, that's up to the court. Here's truly Johnny Dollar. Welcome back. This is an interesting episode. There are things about Lester James that do make him seem kind of sympathetic. His war service and his generally decent life until he went wrong. And these type of things explain a bit why Johnny is so eager to try and do whatever he can for the guy. Yet there are also aspects of James that can make him uh, seem less sympathetic. His way that he approaches the theft of the money and Johnny's entire investigation, as if Johnny has no right to search for the money that was stolen, and his general crummy attitude even after Johnny saved his life, makes him seem kind of petty and childish, as perhaps does his whole understanding of what it takes to win a woman's love. It seems like a really sort of immature approach that ultimately turns him into a bit of a loser. And if that's all that's going on in this episode, it's kind of just one of those typical downbeat episodes of Johnny Dollar that you hear in the O'Brien and Lund eras. But then we get that scene where Margie calls and finds out that there's a difference owing and offers to pay it. And when she gives that explanation, I think they made a great choice there to have a bit of silence. And I love the way that John Lund plays it, because Johnny is clearly moved by her kindness. And I think it's a good thing to have on this series, because in many ways, Johnny Dollar, uh, you know, at this point, it's a series that, you know, so often had these very downbeat endings. In fact, they would go out of their way, you know, sometimes beyond what was even realistically plausible to provide this ending that often pointed to just the sort of depths of depravity and nastiness that exists in the world. So having him get a case which ends in such a sweet and truly kind way just makes a great contrast and also, I think, adds to the realism. Because some uh, programs will say, you know, we're realistic. No, you're just depressing. Because you really only focus on the negative side of life and the negative side of humanity. Now, of course, there can be a cause for programs like that, a market for it, certainly. But I think when you go too far in that direction, you're not really going into realism. You're just going to, to you know, cynicism. I thought this is a nice touch. I, I like this episode for really presenting that nice contrast. And I guess there was one other thing that I noticed in that is, you know, Margie is a performer. And sometimes when you think of performers, you think of them, you know, having the ability to have these big dramatic action. But it's definitely clear that she was not looking for or waiting for applause by the fact that she was a little confused by Johnny's whole silence. For her, she was just doing it because it was the kind and nice thing to do. And you only hope that Lester James you know, makes a better go of it the next time. 
All right. Well, listener comments and feedback now. And I got a comment here from YouTube. Uh, Vincent writes, uh, I've greatly enjoyed all of the Bob Bailey Johnny Dollar episodes, especially the 15-minute serial episodes from Bailey's first season as America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Uh, is this uh, recent posted to YouTube John Lunn episode something you've run before? I'm curious about this because I had thought that you'd already ran the entirety of Johnny Dollar uh, series uh, years ago. Well, thanks so much for the question, Victor. And yeah, we have actually, we've done all of the stories uh, that we've done so far uh, before, but when we came to the end of Johnny Dollar, it actually took us nine and a half years to get through uh, every episode of the series. We started out October 2009, finished up May of 2019. And we decided to go ahead and just start all over again. There were a couple of reasons for this. First was just the practical side. Johnny Dollar is just a huge draw for the podcast. The fact that every week we feature an episode of Johnny Dollar gets people interested in the main podcast feed, and our Johnny Dollar podcast feed on its own generates a huge number of downloads each month. And the second thing is that I've kind of had an evolving uh, view of re-listens. Uh, when I first started doing the podcast, I was pretty firmly opposed. You know, we're always going to be going through stuff we haven't gone through before. And for the most part, that's what we still do. I mean, there are exceptions. Johnny Dollar is a big one right now. And we've also done Dragnet, and we did, you know, Box 13 a second time about a year ago. Come to, to realize that series are... It's a different experience listening through a series a second time. Because if for no other reason, you're a different person than when you first listened to it. And in the case of Johnny Dollar, when we restarted with Charles Russell, I hadn't really listened to the Charles Russell episodes in nearly a decade. So for both of those reasons, we did end up starting through them again. I will say that this time it's probably going to be closer to 10 years to get through all the episodes, just because during the first 10 seasons, I never took a week off. You know, now we have the two vacation weeks each year to try to add a little bit of balance to my life. In addition to that, we had three episodes of Johnny Dollar that came into circulation after we'd already finished those particular Johnny Dollars up. And so I just... Uh, made a spot for them on Tuesdays where we did Johnny Dollar the Lost Episodes. But this time, we're going to hear them in the uh, original place they were in order. In addition to that, we have five episodes already that were not in circulation the first time we went through, but will be played for you. And so that, too, will expand in the amount of time that we end up taking to go through uh, Johnny Dollar the second time. But thanks so much for your comment. I really appreciate it. Now it is time to thank our Patreon supporters of the day. And because this is the first Friday in October, we are going to thank those who have been Patreon supporters uh, for the past six years and so I want to go ahead and thank Jeff, supporting us at the rookie level of $2 per month, and Debbie, supporting us at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Both uh, became uh, Patreon supporters in October 2015. Again, thank you so much for six years of support. Well, uh, that will do it for now. I do want to uh, remind you, if you are watching this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, mark the notification bell to be notified whenever we add a new episode. Next Friday, we'll be back uh, with another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. 
Tomorrow, though, be sure and listen for Tales of the Texas Rangers, where... Yeah, but I wasn't there, I tell you. Ever hear of fingerprints? Oh, sure. Here are yours. And here's a set found at the crime. They match. You still say you weren't there? I didn't kill nobody. Let me see your hands. When'd you wash them last? I don't know. Maybe a couple of days ago. You know, we can tell if you fired a gun. I never had no gun. Did you rob the man in the car? No, no. Look at me. You were there, weren't you? We can prove it. Well, all right. All right, I was there. But I didn't kill him. And I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. And uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.